Aristotle's examination of the soul is properly thought of as a part of his biology, since the soul, the suke, psyche, as we uh, say today, is the cause of life in all things. He writes, quote, what has soul is distinguished from what lacks soul by life. What has soul is distinguished from what lacks soul by life. That's on page 516 in our text in the left-hand column. That is, for Aristotle, soul should not be thought of primarily as the seat of consciousness or sentience, the mind or intellect or seat of perception, knowledge, and memory, uh, as it is in Plato. It's rather the cause or principle of life in a living thing. So it will, as we'll see, include things like perception, knowledge, and memory, but it shouldn't be understood as being restricted just to that more intellectual, so to speak, uh, capacity or center of personality in the human person, as we tend to think of it. So he defines the soul in a number of ways, as we'll see as we go through, but I want to let these get these out at the beginning here, just so we can have them as a point of reference. So the soul is, he says, the actuality of a natural body. And it is the substance as form of a natural body that has life potentially. And it is the first actuality, these are all his definitions now, the first actuality of a natural body that has life potentially. So the actuality of a natural body. Now, previously we saw that Aristotle associates in a substance the actuality of the thing with the form as opposed to the potentiality, which is the matter. So a particular matter has a potential to take on various forms, and when it does, it's actualized as a particular form. And so actuality here is associated with form, and this is part of the second definition, the substance as form. So... In other words, one way of conceiving of the substance of a thing is its form. The substance of the statue of Athena is the form of Athena that the bronze has taken under the um, working of the sculptor who formed it, shaped it into that form. That's so that it's, it's now an Athena. That is what it is. That is its substance, in other words. But we think of, so um, actuality, substance, and form can have that kind of relationship in Aristotle. The substance as form of a natural body that has life potentially. So this contains the idea that the soul is that form of a natural body that it comes to have when it comes to be alive. It's alive, like Frankenstein monster. It comes to have the soul, it's ensouled, meaning it comes to have the form that before it just had potentially. So when this form comes into the thing, it comes to life. That's what the soul is. And then finally, the first actuality of a natural body that has life potential. So the, the difference here, of course, is this idea of the first actuality. So the first actuality, meaning that this is the condition of all other actualities. So... Uh, being ensouled is the condition of all other living behaviors, whether it's waking, sleeping, running, sitting, thinking, remembering, sensing, perceiving, digesting, defecating, whatever, all these living um, processes uh, all presuppose the soul. That's what the first actuality means here. So this, these are some of his definitions of the soul. Now, for Aristotle, the soul is combined with the body in a natural living organism as a form-matter compound. So the soul is the form, the body is the matter. 
can even make that explicit here. When we're talking about the form here, we're talking about a form matter compound, what is described as a hylomorphic compound from the Greek words for hyle, which is matter, and uh, morphe, which is form, so form matter compound, where the soul is the form and the body is the matter. Now, there are two notions of form here that will become relevant as we go through. I'm just kind of giving an overview at this point. But we need to keep in mind that what I've been talking about so far is what we might call the essential form. The soul is an essential form. Without the soul, the animal or plant ceases to exist as an animal or plant. It might become meat or a vegetable side dish, but it's, it's not an animal or plant anymore without its soul in the sense in which Aristotle understands soul. So it's an essential form. The soul is an essential form. Take it away, it ceases to be what it is. That's what this idea of essence means, the what it is of something. So take that away, take that essential form away, it ceases to be what it is. But there are also coincidental or, or accidental forms. And as we'll see in the process of perception, coincidental or accidental forms are acquired by the soul. So when I perceive something that is green, for example, um, for Aristotle, my soul is going to acquire the perceptual part of my soul specifically, is going to acquire the form of green. It is going to, in a sense, be conformed to that. It's going to become that. And so, that, but that is not an essential aspect of my soul. It's just an accidental or coincidental aspect of it. So the soul and its perceptions can take on accidental or coincidental forms. So there, to avoid confusion, we always need to keep in mind that there are a couple different levels at which we're talking about forms here when we're talking about the soul. There's the the soul, the, the form that the soul itself is, which is an essential form that makes a living thing a living thing. And then there are the various coincidental or accidental forms that that soul can take. So it's a kind of form of the form in that sense, right? And a, a coincidental form that it, it obtains um, within or that um, is attached to, we might say, an essential form. So the, but the soul itself is understood as being something that changes its form in some way, accidentally or coincidentally, in relation to the presence of an object of perception. We'll see more of that um, as we go through the text. Now, in modern philosophy, the relation of soul and body is often presented as the mind-body problem, and you're probably familiar with this problem from your Phil 101 class or whatever it was called when you took it. But this is not a major issue for Aristotle. I should say that up front, that he's, he's explicit about that. This isn't a major issue, as it is, for example, in a dualist like Plato, where it is more of an issue, but whether the mind and the body, the soul and the body are one substance or more than one, because he sees them as relating in this hylomorphic relation. He doesn't see the soul and the um, body as two separate substances, but rather as one substance, the soul being the form of the body and the body being the material of the body or providing the material, you might say, that's structured um, by a particular soul. And so um, there's not going to be this problem of how can these two separate substances interact in Aristotle, because it's just one substance, which is soul body, soul hyphen body, you might say, and it's related as form matter. So that's important to understand about uh, Aristotle's conception of the soul. And the mind-body problem also is often related to the question of the immortality of the soul, where the issues are whether the soul is separate from the body, whether it's separable, whether it can exist separately from the body, which is an explicit issue, for example, in Descartes' meditations, if you're familiar with that. Now, Aristotle holds in general, as you might expect with this hylomorphic conception, that generally the, the soul, for the most part, cannot ex exist separately from its embodiment, um, as you would expect when you think of the soul is just the form of, of a material. So, you know, in what sense can, let's say, the form of Athena um, that's in a particular statue exist separately from the bronze of that statue? It can't. And you, if that's the analogy we're, we're going with, it would seem that the soul also should not be able to exist separately. But actually, with Aristotle, there is a caveat. As we'll see, there's a particular part of the soul, 
namely the understanding or the mind, as it's sometimes also translated, it's, the, it's noose, the same word that uh, Anaxagoras used, um, that that part of the soul, which is just a part of the soul, the, for Aristotle, the mind or the understanding, as it's translated in our text, is just a part of the soul. But that part of the soul, Aristotle thinks there are reasons to think that it can exist separately, that it does have a kind of immortality that the body doesn't have. At least he seems to suggest that. But as for the rest of the soul, and what are the other parts of the soul? We'll get to that uh, very quickly here. But the other parts of the soul cannot um, exist separately from the body. They're mixed in with the body. So what are these other parts of the soul? So the anima is, is properly described as psychology as well as biology, insofar as it focuses for the most part on the powers of the soul, which is not a topic totally foreign to what we tend to think of today as psychology. So what are these powers of the soul? So these are first um, initially listed as follows. Powers, these are the parts, the tr uh, traditional term for this is the faculties. That was the scholastic term that you'll sometimes see. The powers, the, the parts or the faculties of the soul what are they? I think it's most illuminating to think of them as the powers of the soul, because this, these are the things that the soul does to the material um, and that make it a living thing. So first he lists um, as these nourishment, or let's say nutrition, generation, uh, and growth are all kind of included under this for him. Uh, perception. And related to this, as we'll see later on, is, a, is the notion of imagination and um, understanding. Or mind would be another translation you might sometimes see. And then later on, he also adds desire, um, which is a kind of movement principle. Because um, in Aristotle's philosophical context, in particular, the, the soul is going to be associated with movement. And the Latin title of this work, De Anima, um, you see, you know, animal animation um, is spoken in this word, which is a root for it. But it's the, the idea of something that's animated, something that's moving. So this is part of the Greek notion of suke as well. Um, Although, as we'll see, it's not, for Aristotle, it's not the essential thing as it would be for other philosophers about the soul because he regards uh, living things like plants that don't have the capacity for movement as also being part of, um, or having souls uh, because the soul is more of a general principle of life for him. So these are the, the powers of the soul, the parts of the soul. Uh, there's the nourishment the perception, the understanding, and the desire. And these represent a kind of a hierarchy. Um, and in fact, so I've listed them sort of the way Aristotle lists them and discusses them, but we might also picture these in a couple other ways. And I'll just draw the picture here and let's you use your imagination. Um, a couple different ways. You might think of this also as a kind of a pyramid where um, you could have a very basic soul. This is sort of like the basic model car or a starter home, um, which is just going to involve the nutritive part of the soul, the nourishing part of the soul that is responsible for nourishment. Uh, but then you can add on to this more complex, more... Um, capacities, uh, more bells and whistles, so to speak, if you think of the, the car analogy here, um, and make it fancier. And that's where you add on to it perception. And then you have not just a plant, which is, has just nutrition, but also an animal, which has perception and nutrition. And then onto that, you can add um, understanding, which involves um, the capacity for um, thinking, thought, scientific knowledge, deliberation, which is characteristic of human beings on top of that. And then I add an extra layer here for desire because we have four of them. But that would that would go along with um, 
combination of um, either imagination and understanding uh, and desire would go along with the animal or um, human levels of the soul. So there's, it's really just three sort of basic souls. There's the merely nourishing one, which is the plant soul, the perceptive one, which is the animal one, and then the understanding one, which is the one that is human. And so you can also think of these as sort of circles that involve a narrower sphere in each case. So the, the, the widest sphere includes all living things, plants, animals, humans, and then more narrowly um, just all the animals, and then more narrowly still the human animals. So it, it leads to a kind of hierarchy of living things where there's something that unites all living things, namely this power of nourishment, and we all have that kind of soul. But then more complex organisms, animals and human beings have more complex souls, and they add more accoutrements, so to speak, to the soul beyond just the nourishing. So you get a hierarchy of living, of living beings, with, of course, human beings at the top and plants at the bottom. So in general, um, what you mean is a nutrition, that this is the most basic, it's common to all living things. It involves what nourishes and also what is nourished. So um, that's the primary soul that we all, all living things have is um, being nourished, uh, which is nourished by nourishment or food. And nourishment for him is going to belong to beings with souls only. Food, qua food, pertains only to living um, beings. Nourishment leads to growth. And the growth of a living thing is going to have a teleological dimension for Aristotle. That is to say, it's going to be end-directed. It's not the mere mechanical addition of material, since the growth of living things exhibits specific end-directed patterns. Notably, the young X grows into a mature X, right? The puppy grows into a dog, not into a cat. And the kitten grows into a cat, not into a dog, and so forth. And then it ceases growing when it becomes mature, uh, and so forth. So, and it's not just an additive process. It's specific ways in which the, the form takes shape, and so forth. And so growth is part of this nutritive soul. It's what the nutritive soul is responsible for this. And perception is what distinguishes animals from plants. Uh, it's a kind of change and alteration. And in the, it's got this sort of active, passive, hybrid character. It's a potentiality to be changed in certain ways. That's what perception is in the soul, our perceptual capacity. It involves the animal receiving a perceptual form when in the presence of an external object. And when an animal is affected by an object of perception for Aristotle, it is made like it and such as they are, as he says. It's made like it and such as they are. We are made like the, the, the perceptual part of the soul, rather, is made like the external object is. It take, takes on its form. So the perceptive power of the soul has the potential to be conformed to, to receive the form of an object of perception. But it isn't a completely passive capacity of the soul. It also involves a kind of ability to uh, discern things and so forth. So it's not completely passive, but it is um, fundamentally dependent upon external objects affecting the soul. As a result of the causal effect of an object of perception on the perceptive power of the soul, the soul takes on the form of the object, becomes conformed to the object. That's the basic account of perception. So we have nutrition, nourishment, we have perception, and then uh, the third is understanding. Understanding, or mind, nous, is the part of the soul that knows and understands and is distinctively human. Parallel to the way that perception works, thinking or knowing, understanding, involves the mind taking on the form, not of a perceptual, perceptible object now, but of an intelligible object. This, this, the soul here is somehow made like the intelligible object. The understanding, the mind is conformed to the intelligible object. And this has a particular importance in Aristotle's account of the understanding or the mind in that, according to him, the understanding or mind is nothing in actuality before thinking. It's just a potentiality. And it, therefore, in a certain sense, it, it, he even says it becomes its object. So... This um, is a notion that interpreters have struggled with for a long time, but that's 
Aristotle's view. And this is related to the view that I alluded to earlier that suggests that the understanding is the part of the soul that actually is potentially immortal. And we'll see how that works when we go th into the text. And then finally, desire and movement. Animals are capable of locomotion and desire is needed to account for this. And uh, desire, though, is insufficient for action on its own for Aristotle. It requires, in addition, uh, either a form of imagination or a kind of practical understanding. And we'll see how that works as well. So that's the, uh, that's the basic overview of the nature of the soul. Um, it's Aristotle's view of it as the, as the first actuality or the form of a natural body standing in a hylomorphic relationship with the body such that the substance of a natural um, organism, living organism, is a kind of form matter um, composite or compound that consists of a soul and a body that are in a form matter relationship with the soul being the form. And then the powers of the soul, um, all of the all forms of soul, all forms of living things have nourishment. Animals, in addition to nourishment, have perception. And then humans, in addition to perception and, and nourishment, have understanding. And then animals are going to involve, uh, going to possess desire as a principle of, of their movement. These being then the powers of the soul. And we'll say we'll see something more about imagination later on. Okay, so going to the text in uh, chapter one of book one. The soul is described as the starting point of living things, and its study is described as being in the first rank. Aristotle will investigate the nature of the soul, what its substance consists of, and uh, what its coincidence are, including its special attributes. But what method of inquiry is best suited to investigating the soul, he asks. And he decides that it's necessary, first of all, to determine which of the genera the soul belongs to, which here turns out to mean which category does it fall under? Is the soul a, a substance, a quality, a quantity, etc.? That's the initial question. And there's also the question of which of the two fundamental kinds of being it is. Is it an actual being or is it a mere potentiality? Another question is whether the soul possesses parts or is it partless? simple would be the way of thinking about it. Is it complex with, with internal articulation and various parts or is it partless? So these are some of the initial questions. Of course, we've already anticipated the answers to these, but this is how Aristotle begins the inquiry. Also, are there different species or even genera of souls or are they all of a single type? Perhaps one might think each of the various animals has a different species of soul, for example. If the soul itself has parts, as Aristotle will in fact conclude, of course, um, we'll need to know how to differentiate these, those parts. And in fact, for Aristotle, the parts of the soul can only be differentiated by their objects. And the perceiving part is directed toward different objects, different perceptible objects, from the understanding part, the, that is different objects, intelligible objects. And above all, it's crucial to know the what it is of the soul, its essence. For, he says, this is the starting point of all demonstration. That's on page 513 in our text, right-hand column. Yet another question, but one related to the question of any, whether there's anything special to the soul, is whether the soul is separable from the body. An initial observation that Aristotle makes is that the attributes of the soul seem to involve the body, suggesting that the soul is not separable but merely something in or about the body. So he says, this is the top of the right-hand column, page 513, so too the attributes of the soul, spiritedness, mild-manneredness, fear, pity, confidence, and further joy, loving, and hating, would all seem to involve the body, since at the same time as these, the body is affected in a certain way. This is evidenced by the fact that sometimes those strong and vivid affections take place in us, we are not provoked or frightened, whereas at other times we are moved by small and faint ones, as when the body is aroused and its condition is like when someone is angry. It is yet more evident that this is so. For sometimes, though nothing frightening is occurring, people may come to have the affections of a frightened person. If this is so, however, it is clear that the affections of the soul are enmattered accounts. 
in matters accounts or in matter ratios as the footnote there says. So their definitions will be of this sort, for example, being angry is a sort of movement of such and such a body or is a part of a capacity as a result of something for the sake of something. And this is why it already belongs to the natural scientist to get a theoretical grasp of the soul, either all of the soul or this sort of soul. So we see here that these empirical observations that he's just listed here about the soul and the body and how they seem to be intermingled with each other will lead some natural philosophers, of course, to propose a materialist account of the soul, that the soul is just a kind of condition of the body, the way the body is affected. And so we can look at the matter of the body and therefore discern why the soul is experiencing certain things and so forth. However, as we've seen for Aristotle, uh, in natural explanations, we have more than merely a material cause that's involved. There are also formal and final causes. It's not merely the bricks that explain the house, but also the structure or form of the house that explains the house and the ends that the house is to serve. So might something similar be the case in the soul? And it seems, at any rate, that we explain the behavior of the soul in terms not just of conditions of the body, but also in terms of intentions and desires, as well as material causes. I don't get angry merely because my blood boils or whatever else happens. Right? That would have been a more um, crude, primitive explanation, I suppose. My blood is boiling, therefore I get angry. But actually, it's because of how my intentions were blocked or my desire was frustrated that I became angry. So I can give a, I can give a kind of explanation in terms of final causes, in terms of um, my goals and how they were frustrated and so forth. Um, so it seems like that's part of what the soul consists in as well, these final causes, these intentions. Okay, so in chapter two, um, we get past the preliminaries and here Aristotle begins his inquiry into the soul in his accustomed manner by surveying the puzzles that arise concerning the soul and the accounts of it that are given by his predecessors. Most have taken the soul to be a principle of animation, as I mentioned earlier. And there are two aspects of this, movement and perception. In the preceding scientific discussion of the soul before Aristotle, it's thought of often as a principle of movement and a mover. In chapter four, though, he raises a puzzle about this account of the soul, the idea that the soul is a principle of movement. When the soul is pained, enjoying, feeling confident, feeling afraid, feeling angry, perceiving or thinking, there does seem to be some sort of movement occurring. But, but it does not seem to be correct to say that, in every case, the soul is responsible for the movement. Rather, in many of these cases, it seems to be that the soul is what is being moved from the outside. There's a distinction to be made, for example, between perception, which begins from particular external objects, and recollection, which seems to begin from the soul. Thus, the human being seems to be affected in many ways that cause even thoughts, um, certainly emotions, feelings, love, hate, pleasure, pain, and so forth. Aristotle regards the understanding as a special part of the soul, one that has the most reasonable claim to being separable and unaffected by the changes of the body. He even suggests that it might be immortal. For it seems, he, this is quoted from him, he says, it seems to be born in us as a sort of substance and not to pass away. It's in book two that Aristotle begins to construct his own account of the soul. And this will be based, as stated earlier, on his theory of substance. So he describes this on page 512 uh, in the left-hand column. Sorry, page 515 in our text, page 515, left-hand column, book two now. We say then that one kind, genos, among beings is the substance. And of this one sort as matter, which is intrinsically not of this something, and another is shape and form on the basis of which something is already said to be of this something, and a third the compound of these. The matter is potentiality, whereas form is actuality, and this in two ways. 
as scientific knowledge is and as contemplating is. So um, we can speak of substance in, in three different ways. We can speak of substance as as the stuff, the matter. Like what's the what's the sub? I'm pointing to a statue of Athena that's made of bronze, and I, what's the substance there? And it's, it is natural for us to say, well, it's the bronze, it's the stuff, right? But we can also say, well, it, the substance is the essence of what, what it is, which is a, an, it's an Athena, and that is I'm mean, pointing to the form now. Or I can I can think of the substance as the compound of the matter and the form, the bronze Athena. So that's the way he's thinking of it. Clearly, it's this last one, the highly morphic conception of the bronze Athena that includes both form and matter, that is the um, fullest account. So this is what is known as highly morphism, which literally means just form matterism. This word goes to form, this goes to matter. So it's crossed over, I put them in the other way. Um, that's what hylomorphism is. Form, form matterism. It's the technical philosophical term from the Greek words for form and matter. In an organic living substance, the form is, as already stated, the soul, and the matter is the body. So Aristotle's view can be viewed as a hylomorphic conception of a living organism that regards the soul as the form of the body and the body as the matter of the soul. And there you have it. That's the view. So well, it's the uh, flesh and blood or the plant material that gives the potential stuff to fill in the form. It's the form that actualizes flesh and blood into an actual animal. And in fact, um, apart from a soul that makes flesh and blood alive, there, there really isn't flesh and blood. There's just potential flesh and blood, you might say, as a kind of potential that, as it were, floats in the ether that could exist. But, of course, if you kill uh, an animal, you no longer have, um, you know, flesh and blood except by, um, by uh, homonymy, as Aristotle would say, by kind of extension. What you have now is meat, um, or you have a carcass, or you have a corpse. You no longer have flesh and blood in the primary sense of those terms. Um, you can speak of them by extension, of course, but um, that's not the primary sense of flesh and blood, which is living material. And similarly with plant material, you might have vegetables for dinner, but you no longer have a plant. And so our plant material, when the, the soul in Aristotle's sense of soul is um, left, you have just a potential, material, you have material that's potential. And it's actualized by the form that enlivens it, that animates it, you might say if we take animate to mean not movement, but just enlivens. So life is given a sort of definition here as self-nourishment, growth, and decay. Um, self-nourishment, growth, and decay, but this seems not to be an exact or technical definition. It seems to be just a rough sketch to delimit the area of inquiry at this point. I don't think he would want to say that that's the definition of life as self-nourishment, growth, and decay. He goes on to explain how the soul relates to a living being. Um, this is a little bit farther down in the column from where I was just reading. So every natural body that participates in life will be a substance, but a substance such as a composite is. But since it is also a body of such and such a sort, for it has life, it will not be a body. For the body is not among the things that are predicated of an underlying subject, but is rather as an underlying subject is and matter. It is necessary then for the soul to be substance as form of a natural body that has life potentially, but substance is actuality. Therefore, it is the actuality of such a body. The end of the paragraph that he says, this is why the soul is the first actuality of a natural body that has life potentially. So the soul is actuality in the sense of 
first actuality, as I described earlier. It's what actually makes the body into a living body, not merely its various activities of living. He says, for both sleeping and waking depend upon the presence of the soul. All the other activities of the soul depend upon the presence of the soul. The form that is the soul is the first actuality that enables all the other living activities to take place in this chunk of matter, right? Which becomes, which was potentially merely flesh, merely potentially flesh and blood or plant material, and now becomes actually such when it takes the form of a soul into it so to speak. For Aristotle, this hylomorphic conception of the soul-body relation eliminates any questions about materialism or dualism. The mind-body problem in the modern sense simply does not arise any more than um, a special philosophical problem arises about how the structure of a house and its materials um, relate. And though I suppose there are various metaphysical problems about identity you might raise about that. But the soul is an essential form. Without the soul, the animal or plant ceases to exist, at least as that type of substance. In fact, the soul seems to stand in a more essential relation to the material of the body than the form typically does to the matter of the substance. In the case of a house, the bricks and the wood would remain if the house is disassembled and the form was lost. In the case of an axe, uh, the iron and the wood would remain if the axe were crushed and broken and lost the form. But in the case of the human body, it's no longer really a human body if it loses its soul. As I said, stated earlier, it just becomes a corpse. It becomes meat. And so Aristotle will say an eye that loses sight is no longer an eye except homonymously. Hence, Aristotle concludes that at least certain parts of the soul are not separable from the body, or at least not from certain parts of the body. However, he leaves open that the soul or parts thereof might still be present the way that the sailor is of the ship. And we're naturally reminded here of what he earlier said about the understanding, suggesting that, that perhaps the understanding may leave the body like a sailor can leave the ship. Okay, so this leads to the first discussion question. Is Aristotle's hylomorphic conception of the soul-body relation a proper way to understand how they relate to each other? That is, this idea of the soul as being in a form matter composite, where the soul is the form of the body and the body is the matter of the soul. Is that the proper way to understand how they relate to each other? Can it account for such phenomena as consciousness or the causal interaction between mind and body? Do you see any problems with this conception? Explain what you see as the strengths and weaknesses of this view. So once again, first discussion question, is Aristotle's hylomorphic conception of the soul-body relation a proper way to understand how they relate to one another? Can it account for such phenomena as consciousness or the causal interaction between mind and body. Do you see any problems with this conception? Explain what you see as the strengths and weaknesses of this view. So we're on to chapter two now of uh, book two. Aristotle now turns to the question of the internal constitution and parts of the soul. What does the soul consist of? We start from the premise that the soul is the principle of life in a living thing. Quote, what has soul is distinguished from what lacks soul by life. What has soul is distinguished from what lacks soul by life. Page 516 in the left-hand column. This provides a clue to investigate the soul. If the soul is what accounts for the life of a living thing, then whatever life is must be in some way in the soul. But what is life? Well, initially, Aristotle lists several things that are conventionally understood as being involved in life. So he mentions understanding, perception, locomotion, nourishment, growth, and withering. Not all living things, however, exhibit all of these capacities. In fact, it seems that we have kind of a nested hierarchy of living beings. At the most basic level are plant life. 
These living beings exhibit growth and decay and nourishment, but they do not have locomotion, perception, or understanding. However, this plant level of life is essential to all life and is found in all life. What distinguishes the higher forms of life is the addition of other life capacities on top of nutrition, growth, and decay. These additional life capacities include first, perception in the case of animal life. For Aristotle, it is the capacity of perception that distinguishes animal from plant life. Even if it doesn't move or change place, it's considered an, an animal as opposed to a plant if it has perception. And for him, the primary sort of perception is the sense of touch. At this point, Aristotle seems prepared to refine his earlier list of the concomitants of life into a list of the defining components of the soul. So, on page uh, 516 in the left-hand column, last uh, sentence of the second to last paragraph, he says, The soul is the starting point of the things we mentioned and is defined by these, namely by nutrition, perception, thought, and movement. So nutrition, perception, thought, which later on seems to be re-described as understanding, and movement with respect to place um, are the initial concomitants of life. And then at the, at the beginning of uh, chapter 3, he says nutrition, perception, desiring, movement with respect to place, and thought. So these are the defining components of the soul that we uh, listed out earlier on the whiteboard. Well, these are the soul components. Not every type of soul will have all of them. He still considers it possible at this point, or at least he entertains it as a hypothetical possibility, uh, that there could be several different and distinct souls rather than just different parts of the soul. But he rejects this view, ultimately, he says, because of the foregoing considerations. And probably he means by this that if the soul is the form of the body, then it is a principle of unity, and thus itself must be unified. However, there are distinct parts of the soul, distinct in the sense that they are distinct in account. The fact is that different types of matter have the potential to take different types of souls. A body that is a plant body can only take a plant soul, and a body that is an amoeba body can only take an amoeba soul, and a body that's a cow body can only take a cow soul. Only a human body can take a human soul. So obviously Aristotle would be unsympathetic to certain forms of Hinduism and Buddhism. So uh, as I uh, just stated in chapter 3, Aristotle adds desire to his original list of parts of the soul. Um, however, this addition is presented in the uh, following passage as a derivation from the part of the soul that has perception. All living things require nourishment. In perceiving living beings, things that would provide nourishment are perceived and desired. So desire goes along with the need for nourishment combined with perception. The basic form of the soul is the one that um, consists only in the capacity for nutrition and consequently growth. Nutrition and growth seem to be sort of the one process for uh, him. So we have the, that's the basic form of the soul. The starter, the starter version of the soul is just the nutritive soul that we see in the plants. And to this soul may be added various perceptual capacities based upon the different senses that the different types of animals have. So, of course, here, when you're dealing with perception, there are different kinds of perception, the perceptive capacities, different kinds of perceptual capacities. So you have different kinds of additions that you can add on to, as it were, the basic nutritive soul. And this, in turn, uh, is... Um, or onto this in turn, I should say, is added the capacity for thinking and understanding, which is distinctive of the human soul. And so there, there's a kind of um, relationship here of building on. Without the nutritive part, there is no perceptive part. So the perceptive part has to be built upon the nutritive part. And without the perceptive part, there is no thinking part, um, except maybe with some caveats about the understanding. But further within the perceptive part, the sense of touch is basic and, 
um, the condition for all the rest within Aristotle. So there's a kind of relationship of one thing being built upon the other here. So in chapter four, uh, Aristotle turns to the detailed examination of each of the various parts of the soul. These parts are capacities, but since a capacity is always a capacity for a certain activity, the account of the capacity will be derived from the account of the corresponding activity. For example, the understanding will be given an account in terms of what the activity of thinking consists in. Aristotle begins logically with the most basic capacity, the capacity for nourishment and generation. Uh, he mentions generation here instead of his previously growth. By this he means reproduction. Generation is reproduction. Uh, quote, for it is the most natural function in those living things that are complete and not disabled or spontaneously generated to produce another like itself, unquote. Page 518, uh, right-hand column. At this point, natural teleology, um, for the sake of-ness, is what I call it, for the sake of-ness, something is for the sake of something, that's natural teleology, is introduced into Aristotle's account of the soul at this point. All living things seek to produce, for they all seek to share in what is eternal and divine. And this is how mortal things can do that. You hear here echoes of Plato's Symposium. We've already seen that the soul can be considered as the formal cause of a natural organic substance. Aristotle reminds us of that here. The soul is also described as the cause of movement, as the efficient cause in living substances. But this movement is always directed teleology, teleologically toward the, towards an end or for the sake of something. It has a goal directedness or final cause. And the soul is also responsible for this, apparently. This goal directedness obviously it takes the form of movement for the sake of satisfying desires in the case of animals. However, even in plants, there's a kind of goal directedness, even though it's not conscious. This is because the growth of plants is not a mere mechanical accretion of material. It involves teleology and goal directedness. The goal of each uh, plant, rather the growth of each plant, I should say, the growth of each plant is constrained in certain definite and predictable patterns. In this, the growth of a plant is much different from, say, the growth of a fire which grows in an uncontrolled fashion, limited only by how much fuel is available. Strictly speaking, nothing is nourished that does not partake in soul. That's a quote from page 520 in the left-hand column. Nothing is nourished that does not partake in soul. So we might speak loosely and metaphorically about feeding a fire, but for Aristotle, the only true food or nourishment is relative to an ensouled being. Nourishment is relative to an ensouled being. In other words, it's definitive of nourishment that it belongs to a living being. So you could even say it's definitive of food, that food belongs, is, is the food of a living being. And you can speak metaphorically about food in another sense. You can speak about feeding the, um, you know, the paper shredder or whatever, but you're speaking here in a metaphorical sense. That's the point. Nourishment is what is incorporated into the substance of a living thing and thereby must be of an appropriate type in order to be so incorporated. So, you know, you are what you eat, right? There's, there's got to be a kind of affinity between the nourishment and the living thing. Chapter 5, From Nourishment and Nutrition, Aristotle turns to perception. We're moving on now to the perceptive soul. Perception is, or seems to be, he says, a sort of alteration. Perception is a sort of alteration. Perception, uh, to perceive is to undergo a change, you might say. There is a, there, there's a change occurring when perception is occurring. Perceptive capacity is not an activity, at least not, at least not intrinsically, but instead, it's a potentiality for activity. Perception needs something external to affect it in order for it to be activated. Hence, we can speak of perception in two ways, as a potential and as an activity. 
acts of perception are dependent upon the presence of perceptible objects, perceptible objects. Moreover, since we can only perceive acts of perception indirectly through perceptible objects, individual acts of perception are identified and individuated by their objects. Perception is not purely passive for Aristotle. Uh, it's an act, but one that must be activated, so to speak, by an external object. In chapter 6, we see various perceptual capacities being identified and individuated by the various types of perceptible objects. So sight is what perceives colors, hearing is what perceives sounds, taste is what perceives flavors, and so on. There you see the way in which uh, per perceptual capacities are individuated and identified by different percep perceptible objects. Now, in, in these cases, sounds, flavors, colors, and so forth, he calls these special objects, special objects of a given perceptual capacity, special objects of a given perce perceptual capacity. These are the kind of perceptible objects about which a perceptible capacity is, he says, discerning and does not make errors. Discerning and does not make errors. You know, if it tastes sweet to you, well, it it is sweet. There is sweetness. It's not, you're not in error um, insofar as it tastes sweet to you, I guess. If you're seeing red, you're seeing red. That seems to be um, the point. But on the other hand, there are also perceptible objects that are not specific, but common to all. So these would include things like the per perception of movement, rest, number, shape, and size. Aristotle's view seems to be that it's only the special objects that are perceived intrinsically. These, however, are one in all the qualities of substance, hence it would seem to follow that we only ever perceive substances coincidentally. That's the contrast between what we perceive intrinsically, which are qualities like the color of something, um, but then what about the, the thing that is that color? This, he says, we perceive coincidentally. So he describes this uh, 422, A thing is said to be coincidentally perceptible, for example, if the pale were the son of Diartes, Diaries, for you perceive the son of Diaries coincidentally because it is coincident with the pale, which you perceive intrinsically. And that is why you are not affected at all by the perceptible object insofar as it is the son of Diaries. Of the intrinsically perceptible things, it is the special objects that are perceptible in the full sense. And it is to these that the substance of each given perceptual capacity is by nature related. It's tempting to read him here as saying that we don't actually perceive substances directly, but only indirectly through their qualities. However, as we'll see later, we shouldn't read Aristotle as, as some kind of an indirect realist. Um, that believes we only infer the existence of real objects as opposed to perceiving them. I don't think that would be an accurate description of Aristotle's view. And we skip to uh, chapter 11 at this point. One of Aristotle's more notorious theses about perception is that to perceive a perceptible object is for the perceptual capacity to become, in some sense, like the object of perception. The perceptual capacity becomes like the object of perception. In other words, that part of the soul becomes like the object it's perceiving. Uh, he writes, again on 522, bottom left-hand column, the perceptual organ for these in which the perceptual capacity called touch primarily belongs is the part that is potentially such as they are. For perceiving is a sort of thing being affected, and so what does the affecting makes that part such as it is actually, the part being such potentially. It's unclear how to take this. Does he mean it literally? Perhaps there's some plausibility in some cases, like the, uh, the coldness of an ice cube when we perceive it. To perceive the coldness of an ice cube involves our perceptual apparatus becoming cold itself the part in which we feel the ice cube becoming cold. 
But does our sight, our eyes become blue in seeing the clear sky? And that doesn't seem very plausible. Alternatively, of course, we might posit that Aristotle doesn't mean that literally, but symbolically or something like that, uh, schematically, that Aristotle means that the form of the perceptual object enters into our perceptual capacity in some schematic or symbolic way. This is probably the way to interpret it if you want to make his view at all plausible, but that, that is the view. The view is that the perceptual part becomes conformed to what it perceives and becomes like it. In uh, chapter 12, he says that to perceive is to, quote, receive the perceptible forms without the matter. To receive the perceptible forms without the matter. As wax receives the seal of the signet ring without the iron or the gold. A vivid image there. We receive the perceptible forms without the matter as wax receives the seal of a signet ring without the iron or the gold. The perceptual capacity undergoes a change in the presence of a perceptible object, taking on the form of that object. In order for a perception to take place, therefore, the perceptual capacity must have the specific potentiality for receiving that particular type of form. So sight can't, doesn't have the potentiality to receive coldness, the coldness of an ice cube. Um, you know, your, your fingertips don't have the potentiality to receive the form of blue. Well, they can be blue, of course, but they blue the visual um, perception of blue. Here, Aristotle says that it's not the specific perceptual object that that is. It's not the light or the dark or the sound or the odor that produces the alteration that results in a perception, but rather the thing in which these perceptible objects are present that pursue, that um, produces the perception. Okay, book three, starting with chapter three. So perception, which we've just been describing, has to be distinguished from imagination or fantasy. Whereas perception is a capacity for perceiving things, and thus is a capacity for truth, imagination or fantasy is a capacity for fantasizing or imagining by which we are presented not with, with things, but with appearances or phantasms. But what appears to us may be either true or false, and so imagination will not be a capacity for truth. It can be false. Imagination comes about as a result of the activity of perception, and therefore it only occurs in creatures who have perception. So. Imagination is a kind of derivative of perception. It belongs to the perceptive part of the soul. Aristotle suggests that it's the capacity for imagination that's responsible for perceptible errors. On page uh, 524 on the left, he says, But since when something is moved, another thing can be moved by it, and since imagination seems to be a sort of movement and not to take place without perception, but rather in things that perceive and only about things of which there is perception, and since it is possible for movement to come about as a result of the activity of perception and must be like the perception, this sort of movement can neither come about without perception nor belong to non-perceiving things, and in accord with it the one who has it does and is affected by many things, and it can also be either true or false. This happens because of the following things. Perception of the special perceptibles is true or has the least possible degree of false falsity. Remember, the special perceptibles are things like colors, flavors, odors, and so forth. Second, though, there is the perception of the co uh, co coinciding of these, the things that coincide with the perceptibles. And here it is now possible to be an error. For about the fact that something is pale, perception cannot be false, but about whether this or that something else is the pale thing, it can be false. Third, there is perception of the common perceptibles, that is, ones that follow along with the coincidental perceptibles to which the special ones belong. I mean, for example, movement and magnitude. And about these, now it is most of all possible to be an error in accord with perception. But the movement that comes about as a result of the activity of perception will be different insofar as it results from these three sorts of perception. In fact, the first is true as long as the perception is present, whereas the others may be false, whether it is present or absent, and especially when the perceptible object is far away. 
So this is a tricky passage, but perhaps he's saying here that imagination leads us astray about the coincident substances that accompany special perceptibles. Um, and this suggests that it is also possible for imagination to truly present to us the appearance of something that's truly there, um, which would tend to speak against the idea that Aristotle is an indirect realist, I think. But it's, imagination is, is a double-edged sword in this way because it can also present things falsely, and especially when things are far away, and you might say other, under other non-ideal conditions, like when the lighting is poor and so far, um, you may be mistaken about what the coincident thing is that accompanies the special perceptibles, that is the qualities that you can't be wrong about perceiving. Chapter um, four. Finally, we come to um, understanding. Understanding, the highest part of the soul, which is the part of the soul by which the soul both knows and thinks wise thoughts, according to Aristotle. Now, understanding operates in a way parallel to perception, as I mentioned in the uh, introductory overview. It's, it operates in a way parallel to perception. It's only differentiated by its objects. Instead of perceptible objects, as perception has, understanding has intelligible objects. And once again, these objects are forms that are received into the soul, or that the soul, which is itself a form, is conformed to. Aristotle holds the somewhat curious position that the understanding is nothing actual before it receives the forms. The understanding is nothing, is nothing, is nothing actual before it receives the forms. It's a pure potentiality. He says, this is the right-hand column towards the bottom of page 420, uh, 524, it must, therefore, since it understands all things, be unmixed, as Anaxagoras says, in order that it may master them, that is, in order that it may know them. For something foreign intruding into it impedes and obstructs it. So, too, it must have no other nature than this, that it is potentially something. That part of the soul, therefore, that is called the understanding, and I mean by the understanding, that by which the soul thinks and grasps things, is actively none of the beings before it actively understands them. This pure potentiality and lack of actuality seems to Aristotle a reason to think that the understanding is the one part of the soul separable from the body. Since it's nothing actual from the intelligible forms it receives, it's totally unmixed with anything of the body. It's completely simple in itself, pure potentiality, simple potentiality and it's in no way mixed with the bodily. The immortal sort of understanding, however, is not a mere potentiality. He makes that clear in the next chapter, chapter five. Rather, it's what he calls the productive understanding, that is, the immortal sort. It's, th this is not the understanding as a mere potentiality, but as causal and productive, the understanding as causal and productive. Aristotle suggests that the causality he has in mind here is the sort of causality that the understanding of, of, a, of a craftsman has in working his materials into his product. He explains this on uh, 526, left-hand column. There is one sort of understanding that is such by becoming all things, while there is another that is such by producing all things in the way that a sort of state like light does. For in a way, light too makes the potential colors into active colors. This productive understanding is separable, impassive, and unmixed, being in substance and activity, for the producer is always more estimable than the thing affected and the starting point than the matter. Not now understanding and other times not. And when separated, though, this alone is it just what it is. And it alone is immortal and eternal but we do not remember because this is unaffectable, whereas the passive understanding is capable of passing away. And without this, nothing understands. So it's this active, productive understanding, it seems, that has a kind of active actuality. Since it's unmixed, it's not mixed up with any body, and so this is part of the soul that's potentially immortal. And this leads to the second discussion question. Do you agree with Aristotle that there's reason to think that a part of the soul, the understanding, is immortal, or potentially so? Is there reason to distinguish the understanding from the other parts of the soul in this respect? Explain your answer. So once again, second discussion question. 
Do you agree with Aristotle that there is a reason to think that a part of the soul, the understanding, is immortal, or potentially so? Is there a reason to distinguish the understanding from the other parts of the soul in this respect, the active understanding, technically? Explain your answer. Okay, chapter 6 of book 3. The understanding's uh, status as a simple and hence indivisible, indivisible part of the soul goes along with its ability to grasp the truth. In cases where there's no falsehood involved, the understanding grasps an indivisible thing, i.e. an intelligible object that's a simple and unmixed form or idea. With compound or mixed ideas in which different intelligible objects are combined, the possibility of confusion, misunderstanding, or falsehood arises. Understanding itself can take a couple of different forms. It can take the form either of an affirmation or denial, which involves predicating something of something, and is either true or false. However, the simpler act of understanding is not an affirmation or denial, but the simple understanding of the what it is, or the essence of a thing. Chapter 7. In addition to a theoretical understanding that deals with things like mathematical objects, there's also a practical understanding that cooperates with perception and desire in the pursuit of good and the avoidance of evil. The part of the soul that understands, understands the forms in appearances. This understanding leads to a comprehension of what is to be pursued and what is to be avoided. So Aristotle gives the following example here in the left-hand column, page 528. At the top, for example, perceiving the beacon that is a fire by the common perception, seeing it moving, it recognizes that it is the enemy. But sometimes, by means of the appearances or intelligible objects that are in the soul, it calculates and deliberates about future things on the basis of present ones. And when it, the soul, says, as it were, says as there, rather, pleasant or painful, here it pursues or avoids, and so in cases of action generally. What are unrelated to action too, namely the true and false, are in the same genus as the good and the bad, but they differ in that the first is unconditional, the second relative to someone. So he's saying that in the practical sphere, the understanding discerns what the good and bad is relative to us, what's good and bad relative to us, just as in the theoretical sphere, it discerns the true and the false, but the true and the false are true and the false absolutely, not relative to us. Chapter 10. The cause of movement in an animal is called desire. So now we come to desire, the final part of the soul, if it is um, properly understood of as, as a distinct part, certainly a distinct power of the soul. The cause of movement in animals is called desire, which seems, therefore, to be an additional distinct part or power of the soul. However, desire by itself does not cause movement. It must be combined with either perceptual imagination in the other animals or practical understanding in human beings. And in human beings as well, imagination prompted by appetite can, along with desire, cause movement, it seems, for Aristotle, even without or contrary to rational calculation. Uh, Aristotle also suggests an alternative scheme at the end of chapter 10, according to which there are two types of imagination a rationally calculating imagination, which seems akin to the practical understanding. So we have a rationally calculating imagination and then a perceptual imagination, which is the type that the other animals have as well. On this scheme, desire must be combined with imagination in order to initiate movement. It's the object of desire that sets the agenda, so to speak, for the practical understanding, which deliberates about the means to the end that is the object of desire. And it's this object of desire, then, that is best described as the cause of movement. The understanding by itself cannot cause movement, according to Aristotle. Now, finally, chapter 11, short excerpt from, uh, Aristotle believes that humans are distinctive in that reasoning or rational calculation is practical in us. We are unlike other animals in that we're not merely mechanically prompted by our perceptions and distinctive desires, to pursue objects that satisfy these desires. We can also reason and deliberate, and these reasonings and deliberations can become immediately practical. 
So the, he describes this um, as follows. Now, a perceptual imagination, as we said, also belongs to the other animals. But the deliberative sort exists only in the rationally calculated ones. For whether to do this or that is already a work of rational calculation, and we must measure one standard by one standard since we are pursuing the greater good, and so we must be able to make one appearance that results from many. And this is the cause of these animals seeming not to have belief, namely that they, they do not have the imagination that results from a syllogism, but this has that. That is why desire does not have the deliberative capacity, but sometimes defeats and moves wish, whereas sometimes wish does this to it, just like a ball, one desires does it to the other desire, as when lack of self-control occurs, but by nature the higher is more ruling and causes movement. So there are already three spatial movements to be caused, but the scientific part is not moved but remains at rest. And since the one supposition and premise is universal, the one supposition and premise is universal, and the other is particular, for the first says that any man of such and such a sort should do an action of such and such a sort, and the second is such that this is an action of such and such a sort, and I am a man of such and such a sort, it is the latter belief that produces movement, not the universal one. Or rather, it is both, but the one remains entirely at rest, while the other does not. So what he's, he's imagining here is um, the practical syllogism. So something like this, we could say, um, premise one, a courageous man would run into a burning house to save his family. Premise two, there is a fire in our house. And my family is asleep upstairs. And then the conclusion of this according to Aristotle, is going to be an action. Namely, I rush into the house, up the stairs, etc. Now, we can imagine an animal acting instinctively from desire, basically in a similar way, um, but what Aristotle wants to say is that human beings have a rational capacity to be able to reason in this way. And this might be implicit in our dispositions of our actions rather than explicitly rehearsed in our thoughts. But we have a universal premise. Um, you know, a courageous man would act in this way. This doesn't become an action, though, unless I add to it a particular premise that describes a situation where this universal proposition has applicability. And then the action that is with the conclusion that follows from this. That's why this is a practical syllogism as opposed to theoretical. It's not really a theoretical conclusion that follows, but rather an action follows from these two premises. This is Aristotle's account of the practical syllogism. And you could multiply other examples. A temperate man would only have one piece of cake for dessert. I'm now being offered a second piece of cake. Conclusion is my action of saying, no thanks to the offer, and so forth. So that's the practical syllogism. And this is the way in which practical understanding and desire um, cooperate in order to produce movement, to produce an action through the aegis of a kind of process of rational calculation, which is distinctive of the human soul.